namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa buddhan dhamam sangham namasami Some of you might know that we are organizing here also the Upasaka meeting. This is like a study <coughs> group. Come here regularly. Uh, part of the program is also not just coming to the meeting, but also applying some practices in their daily life, uh, emphasizing on the virtue. So they keep five precepts. <coughs> very strictly and also at least once a week they give eight precepts they dedicate themselves to the study to regular meditation and they give some kind of material and kind of guidance how to uh, meditate how to and particularly how to contemplate so it's lot of uh, and everything kind of what a Buddha was teaching was was applied to that practice that includes also generosity so they can they come here for the meal so the program is not really something you know that I came out with that idea but it's pretty much uh, what we kind of extracted and got together from the Buddha's teaching and creates environment that is suitable for the practice and increase also kind of creates a community that that can support everyone in the group to continue with the practice so it's suitable condition for realizing the truth and in the last meeting there was a question can lay people become sotapanas and actually I was surprised and I was like, uh, first thought was really, you know, uh, what an odd question. Because, you know, what would you practice if you don't practice for liberation, for the Dhamma, to become a Satapana, you know, or to realize Nibbana? Uh, so what's the point of all this meditation and study and following the program? And then it comes out the question, or can the people become Satapanas? For me, it feels like like it's obvious, and it seems that question should be really addressed and answered, you know, even before that program started. But I was reflecting in that it's not so uncommon that people practice something, but they don't really believe in themselves that they can achieve the liberation. It's even believed that among some traditions, some group of people, individuals, that it's impossible to realize the Dhamma in this present time. Which is a shame to think like that because they or that's become a big obstacle in the progress. Believing in something that's not possible, why it's still possible, it's a, one of the greatest and necessary obstacles. Or some people believe, you know, or okay, it's still possible, but and uh, they very really honor the Dhamma, they honor the monks and practitioners, but they do too little to do something in practice in their daily life. Yeah, they might do kind of they take as a practice more as a hobby or just part time job and they might they maybe we just come to some kind of meditation session and but there is not enough deep sincerity to see that actually this is not just a hobby, this is just it's not just some kind of yoga practice when you go for one hour and then that's it. It is about life. It's about really dedicating whole life, whole waking time to purifying the virtue, 
purifying our actions by body, speech and mind. And of course, if there is not enough belief, then it's very hard to practice that way. That belief is very external. This is external belief. Believing in structures or believing in what the people are saying or believing in teaching, but this is just still very external belief. And I think there are many people around who are very good with external trust and external belief in the practice, uh, but then maybe they don't really realize the internal is still not there. So it would be the, if there will be eternal trust established, then you will not anymore think or about external messages that much or believing in external things and, or which is believing into the words and just admiring other people. But you will start actually trusting yourself. This is like a faith in yourself that you can liberate your mind. That is your potential. That you can be free. And if still there are that kind of trust is not established, this of course, like I said in the beginning, that will be very difficult then to apply those words of teaching into the practice. Will become more remain superficial uh, and the progress will be ra rather very slow. So, yes, we know exactly what is external faith. We are accustomed to it, we know it very well, but we don't know really what is internal faith. But that actually will take some time, of course. But I will, I, I would say that it is possible. Uh, it's my, that's why all this program is all about. That actually, if uh, we are applying practice correctly, if we are following uh, the Buddha's guide and we are uh, sincere in it we don't just believe the empty words but we are learning how to reflect how to contemplate not just taking the trust we don't just intellectually reason things and then we conclude that's the truth we, we're not actually just immediately happy with the first answers but with the dedicated actually is kind of to to the investigation we are interested in the phenomena. So right now, when, when we're listening, we are sitting here, we can do that because we experience. Because there is experience, because there is a feeling, because I see, because I hear. So, but you see that, you know, why this experience come to be? How is it structures? Because we also experience pain, suffering. You know, it's too hot, too uncomfortable. Yeah, do you have a headache? Are you tired? Are you fed up? Are you excited? Are you inspired? So what are all these things having in common? We so much go into investigation of particular things, like I'm depressed, and then we go into analyze our bad childhood. But, you know, but all these things have in common is actually experience. And that's something to be very, something we should uh, give lots of interest in. So when we take the interest and realize like, and when we are recognizing the structure, the experience of that program of the mind, if I can sound more technical, then, and then we also reading the, uh, the manual of the mind and we, are, and we start recognizing those uh, fragments of the mind then realize, oh, it's possible to recognize these things. It's not something in the world, you know, that I can recognize or the hearing can hear, but something that actually it's more in the background. That background, that experience, that has to be first recognized and then we can investigate. And when we are recognize that formula of the mind, everything becomes much clearer. Everything what we experience, or is this depression or uh, inspiration, is all the same because all belong to that field of the experience. Yeah. 
somebody then blames us, sure. Yes, that's an effect. That's the experience. If somebody praises us, sure. Okay, thank you. you know, but it doesn't go too deep. Experience, we can say that, you know, we can talk from many aspects how we want to address it. And sometimes we address as a five aggregates. Uh, sometimes we uh, talking about Nama Rupa Vinyana and so on. But we can also, uh, or through uh, six senses. But one way of where we can also say that experience is structured by internal and external. So every experience is internal and external. There wouldn't be eternal without external and external without internal. So if we are, we are thinking, if we ident identify ourselves with uh, external, now, well, this external wouldn't exist without eternal. But we identify ourselves with internal, but this internal will not exist without external. So what kind of identity that will be if it depends on something else? So which one is you then? So we're quite accustomed actually to, to the external. We analyze, we talk about it, you know, talking in science, talking in general communication, when we're talking about other people, about ourselves, about our body, problems, issues, philosophical questions, is there God or not God? It's all external. Why are we going to eat? It's all external. I like this, I don't like that, it's external. You know, Buddha said this and that, external too, also the same. Bring in, bring out, using techniques, very external. You know, if I do this, I will get that, external. Desires, external. Anger, external. Delusion, external. So what is then remaining as being internal? So internal will be, you know, external is everything really what is in front of us. Everything, you know, I recognize. This is or taking something that's for me. That's me, I am, that's all external. And, aha, and then we say, it's external. But the Buddha said, well, there wouldn't be external without internal. So what will be the internal? Internal will be something which is at the background. Somebody would say, oh, our thoughts internal. No, also thoughts external. In this front of you, you're thinking them. So that's also. So all these spiritualities, you know, available in the world, you know, talking about spirit, spiritual, you know, looking inside of yourself, you know. In the Buddha eyes, okay, from his perspective, that will be also external. <laughs> yeah. So internal, obviously, like I said, is something more subtle, more in the background. Something which we don't really uh, can st we can't investigate in the same way as we will investigate the external things. Because if we put the internal in front of us for investigation, well, that's also become external. The idea about internal internality will be also then external thing for investigation. So this one part of the experience which is real, rather in darkness. It's unknown, but we do suspect it. That's exactly because it's so unknown and in the background. Uh, and we can't really, never really put it in front of ourselves. Well, but we are still quite arrogant. Conceit. You know, we do identify ourselves with the internal. Because, but because of misunderstanding, because of ignorance. We don't really know what it is, we don't really recognize it properly, but that's why 
it feels it's something kind of but we come with some kind of conclusion this kind of external with ex like i said you know you're putting your internal thing in front of you and then you say you make a conclusion that's i am not really able to understand the, the real nature of it and then you have some kind of idea about i am and then you know oh this i am whatever it is some kind of somewhere in the, you know here you know from this perspective and then everything else is for me my so this uh view about external and internal gets quite corrupted distorted but we have to learn uh, how to reflect how to recognize experience as a whole so not so much about fixated in the in, into the world as we, we are accustomed to uh, but recognizing as a one whole so recognizing external and internal in you together so you see why is then an obstacle and danger to anger you know, why is anger a problem you know we usually say oh anger is wrong because you know i know it's not good to hurt other people you know and also because you know it's unpleasant but problem with anger is because it's just <coughs> we get um absorbed in particularity into the external we gratify that our common attitude and this is why the anger is a great obstacle for understanding the dhamma the buddha's teaching because it's more like a being um, hooked you know like a fish being hooked in the trap and then the fisherman can pull this fish anywhere he wants so that's also the same way you know with anger we are hooked and then we are being pulled by the world you know i hate you and that object has completely control over us even though that actually in reality this object has actually no control over us we give it control the same with this desire you know why is sensuality problem because it's again you know it's very fixed i like this i love this i have passion for that and we are hooked like a fish again a problem not because there is a problem with the object not because the project object is fault to the object just we give importance to it and power to it and we allow to it so it's quite irony to think people to think oh i will just relax you know sometimes it's okay to in, uh, indulge in sensual pleasures because i want to relax my practice no you're not relaxing your practice you're making it harder because exactly distorts and defiles and soils that clarity of the wider perspective so in buddha even said in some in in another sutta in Sambhasava Sutta Bhikkhu, I say that the destruction of the taints is for one who knows and see not for one who does not know and see who knows and see what? so attention to the root the one who has established attention to the root so attention of both internal and external who can recognize that that, that one can then destroy uh, all these defilements anger passion delusion one of obstacles if i pick up one particular one as an example fear you know, buddha was explaining how he was dealing with fear he went to the jungle before he became a buddha enlightened and and then he walked he walked to the jungle and the fear arose and he decided well uh, there is a fear and he continued to walk and then another case he was sitting in that thick dark jungle jungle in the middle of the night and fear arose he remained sitting and he was lying down and then the fear arrived and he was lying down he remained lying down or he was standing and the fear came and he remained standing 
So he did not uh, try to act upon the fear. He went to face it. So when the fear and dread came to him, he didn't change the position. This is also important kind of message. You don't need to read only in that particular thing about fear, but just more in general, we can see, you know, that practice is about not running away from unpleasant feeling. You know, when there is the uh, unpleasant feeling, discomfort, you know, what we usually we do. Sometimes we don't really recognize this discomfort because we are so quick into looking for unpleasant, something pleasant, something nice. Yeah? Did you ever wonder why you seek for pleasant things? Why you go to cinema or listen music or watching TV? Very innocent, isn't it? But did you stop and reflect why you're doing that? Oh, because I want to have something pleasant. What's the deal? But did you ever reflect why you're looking for the pleasant things? Because they're a counterpart, which is a pleasant thing. So you wouldn't look for the pleasant stuff if you wouldn't try to avoid unpleasant things. So it's for our life, you know, all our decisions, all our moves and decisions is pretty much about running away from unpleasant things. Yeah. So this is why I came to desire and passion pleasantness or aversion anger avoiding unpleasantness so it's like constant it's like that seed that unpleasantness and our denial of it become architect of our life and our decisions there's a root problem that not understanding the nature of that seed of that unpleasant feeling which we are avoiding it Also, before becoming Buddha, so Bodhisattva, he went to the jungle. It seemed that he was a fearful person. He was also afraid. And it seems he was, he was afraid of those thick jungles. And he went there and he was experiencing fear. Also, there's a story some, some of you might know from Ajahn Chah. He did the same thing. You know, Ajahn Chah was very afraid of the... Uh, channel ground. This is where in Thailand actually they were not burying people in the in the ground, but actually they were burning them in the night or late, late evening, I think. So they were burning some bodies, and he was a monk amongst the special practices. And when everybody was leaving that area, that the body gets burnt to the end. And Ajahn Chah was sitting there alone and meditating in front of that burning corpse. In the jungle <laughs> and you know he was the fear was so strong that he said that next morning he was bleeding blood so <laughs> so there was a practice yeah. <clears throat> but there's an interesting paragraph which sometimes it seems to be ignored or taken out of the context there are Brahmins some recluses and Brahmins who perceive day when it is night and night when it is day. I say on their part, this is an abiding in delusion. But I perceive night when it is night and day when it is day. So what is the difference here? Other practitioners who went to the jungles, they did the same thing, the same practices. But they came how they were resolving their fears is actually in more external thing, you know, changing the perception of the of the forest or the jungle. So it was fearful. It was dark. I say, oh, I perceived the day while it was dark, and I felt better. So it feels good, you know, if you say, oh, you know, it will be a day, it will be all fine, and then. You know, oh, it's nothing there, you know, just imagine it's a day and the fear ceases. And it worked. But the things they didn't really come to any understanding. Just consolation. You know, kind of, sometimes we say, you know, everything will be all right, you know, like a mother says, but, you know, 
especially like you're dying, you know, you're going to die, you have a cancer, and people around you, oh, you'll be fine, you know, you will recover, you know, everything's fine. So that's not the truth. You know, they're just like some stories you create. You know, we just something uh, that might we say or think that we will feel better about it. We kind of start creating some explanations that we feel about better about it. You know, or we do something maybe unwholesome, and we feel guilty maybe, but then it becomes some explanation. You know, oh, somebody has to do it. If I nobody will do it, who will do it? You know, I have to do it. Otherwise, not, nobody will do it. So this is like you know how to how we came came out with some stories, explanations that to avoid responsibility or to basically then to fundamentally uh, avoiding unpleasantness. Okay. So those uh, practitioners who came also to the forest and started changing the perceptions were, it was seems it was working for them, but they had to keep using it all the time, that kind of interpretation, that kind of perception. But that doesn't mean if you're changing the truth and you're creating the truth, uh, that you're actually reaching the truth. Yeah? The same is like this explanation, God will protect you, but you don't know. Yeah? This kind of consol consolations. Yeah? Uh, but Buddha said, but I see day when it's day, and I see night is at night. He sees things as they are. Not justifications, not just intellectual reasoning, kind of covering it up just to feel good about it. I mean, go to the forest, you know, go to the jungle, go to the other forest, actually, it's fearful enough for someone who is not used to it. And see, you know, there will be fear. And you start immediately seeing, then your first reaction was just conciliation. Explanation, you know, oh, you'll be fine, be brave, you know, there's nothing really there. How do you know it's nothing really there? <laughs> you don't know, you know, <laughs> maybe it is bear there, you know, maybe the white boar, you don't know. So, so you just go there. So then you can, when you go to the forest, then you don't just <laughs> go to that kind of explanation. You see, there is a fear. Ah, what's a problem there? Fear is not out there. So it's like, ah, fear is in something more internal. But I don't want to say it. Something deep. Fear is more internal. But you don't want to see it, because why? You're identifying with it. So it feels like then dying. Fear is like you are dying. And that's why you would do anything, any interpretation and external things, to feel then that you don't, you keep your internality intact. Because you think, you believe, falsely believe that it's stable, permanent, unshakable thing. So when the Buddha was practiced correctly, he said, then tireless energy was aroused in me and unremaining mindfulness was established. My body was tranquil and untroubled, my mind concentrated and unified. So just because he was seeing day is a day, night is a night, his mind, his mindfulness was become strong and established, and his mind become unified. Yeah? So his mind was strong enough to start recognizing this uh, in internal aspect. Become unified, see the whole picture together. So kind of wholeness there. Then he was talking about jhanas and so on. So you see there is not like intensity of unification of the mind is not running away from things but seeing things as they really are. 
So how we practice? A, a friend I was just recently talking with, and he was talking about anger. So he realized that he was angry. Yeah. So angry at people, at things, uh, maybe for how they were behaving. But with mindfulness, he was aware of it. He was not really sure how to deal with it. Of course, he knew he followed that he should follow the, the Buddha's guidance. And he, you know, first of the instruction is that don't act upon it. <laughs> yeah. So if you're angry, don't say angry words or do some angry physical action. So don't hit anyone. Yeah. There was anger. That was seeing things as they are. Yeah. Day as a day. So anger is the anger. Not like there should not be anger or this kind of with some kind of interpretation, you know, but I'm the good guy, but I'm the peaceful one and being angry is not really Buddhist things, but I'm Buddhist and these kind of things, you know. No. But just like there is an anger. There's an anger, there's an anger. And you're very mindful of it. Aware. Restraining yourself, aware. And there might be hours, days and weeks passing. But eventually, you know, you start recognizing that nature of anger is in the background. You see how heavy it is. And because, because it's very heavy, it also becomes more unpleasant. So this kind of practice of mindfulness does not mean it's always pleasant. Sometimes, you know, when you practice mindfulness, it feels, you know, unpleasantness is just growing. It's just like, it's heavier, but it's okay. And then eventually there comes a point when we realize that it's too heavy and that you don't have to have it. When you're so mindful that it doesn't become any more you. It's not so much in the background, it becomes more like in the front. And mindfulness is something, how to say, uh, transcended that angry mood. You know, before it was like mind, the current, you were in the current mood, which is angry mood. And you don't really see beyond it, let's say, above it. You're just in it, you're angry. Because with conscious mindfulness, the mindfulness becomes more mind, the mind becomes more unified, more sharpened, more constant, and kind of goes you know a little bit higher, transcends. And then you see that heaviness of the anger and realize that's not mine. And when you realize what you're holding, you drop it. It's like, you know, you're carrying the heavy rocks in your bag and you go to the mountain, hiking in Triglau, you know, and somebody prepares you a bag full of stuff. Actually, he puts in your, in your bag on your rocks and you're carrying it tired and tired. I say, oh, why I need this bag? And, you know, why somebody prepares such a heavy pack lunch? You know, and then you're carrying up and up and up, you know. But when you realize what it is, you drop it immediately. You don't care anymore. And feel light. Lighter, freed, liberated. Because you don't need it. It's not yours. And you drop it. So there's a lot of things which we carry. You know, anger, lust, uh, arrogance, you know, views, ideas, judgments. It's tiring. It's heavy. I remember there was one uh, monk who was, years ago, who was complaining a lot. And I was just looking at him and I said, Are you not tired? <laughs> it's not heavy. You know, but you're older than I am, but, you know, still so much of judgment, so much of things in the head. Are you not tired? Don't drop it. <laughs> and the same, you know, this is... And then, for example, just being conceited and arrogant. It's all based, our judgments, it's all based on the perception, how we see things. And we see things really through a corrupted mind. Yeah? That there's something in the background which is separate from the external and kind of separate from the external and that it is 
therefore permanent everlasting soul, so to speak. Yeah. But you don't know, you don't see clearly. You know, you just so absorb into the world. And that because it can cause kind of arrogance because we always feel there is something special there about let's say us. And then of course we identify ourselves with the pleasant things, with the feeling. And we don't appreciate unfe un unpleasant feelings because it shakens. It's like it's like a threat. And we try to destroy the threat as soon as possible. Try to push away everything what is unpleasant, things, people, experiences. And we always incline and try to hold and grasp everything what is pleasant, what fits me. So that's why we're so happy to get united or hold people who have shared views, thinking, you know, because we identify ourselves also with views. And what a delight is actually, you know, to associate with people who have the same views, because it means like, but if you and you agree with these views, then this view is the right one, is the truth. And, you know, all the other, those, you know, those Republicans or those Democrats, you know, they're such a fools. You know, we are the right one, you know, or God exists because, you know, you and you and you and my mother and my grandmother, they told me that, so it must be truth, you know. And, you know, those heretic, they're really bad guys, they go all the way to hell. So this, this kind of distorted perception goes to that far, that it's just a measuring the world in external level. You know, judgments and then arguments and all the fights, wars and those th all these things which we can read on the, on the news. But the Buddha's practice, like I said, like you probably already figured out, is not going with the stream of the world, but is going to go, should go against the stream quite opposite what everybody is doing. So first starts with just restraining yourself. So instead of saying, I'm angry at you, so first we don't uh, express angry words, but we restrain. But also, you know, it's not just enough just to restrain, just to cool down and that's it. But restrain also means really looking where the real problem lies. Yeah? Recognizing day is a day, as the Buddha would say. So the real problem lies like, I'm running away from unpleasantness. And why I'm running away from unpleasantness? Why is this thing so important to me? Oh, because I identify myself with it. For example. So then we know where really to work is a real problem. So that's my... Uh, invitation for you to practice and this is not just something what is written in the books but it's something that people do practice and do get results out of it the Buddha said this practice is great and beautiful in the beginning of it and in the middle and in the end so we don't have to practice and then just practice practice hard 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 you know in, and we're just, we're just waiting for some kind of satori to happen some kind of click and enlightenment, but actually it means it's very gradual. No matter how much we practice, every step which we do in the right direction, more the mind is going to be freer and happier, more at ease, more tranquil, and eventually, when we are deepening it, even then the mind will be fully liberated. So... We become Sotapanna and so on, <laughs> and all the stages of enlightenment, but it doesn't matter how you call it, you'll be free. And that is still possible. So first, but you have to start gaining not just faith externally, so faith that you should brought you here in this room, but it's, that's not good enough. But you have to now to develop faith internally, so that you do, you have a ability and potential understand those the Buddha's teaching. So thank you for your attention. And uh, 
if is there any question you can ask or, or clarification Came to the root of the problem, anger, or some other feeling. You know? Okay, let's try. Yeah, let's. So, what's the problem? For example. Oh, for example, anger. So you're angry. Or let's say um, fear, more fear. Okay, afraid of. Uh, woods. <laughs> no, so you go to the wood. Yeah. You're afraid. So. You want to look look at the root of the problem. Yeah. So what yeah, I the root, yeah. okay, and then what is the root? We don't know. So what's the root of the problem? In the forest, you're afraid. Very mindful, but you also recognize why you're afraid. But if we don't recognize why we are afraid, we just feel fear. There is fear. Sorry. Too late, probably, it overtake you. Your mind was so weak. Mm. It's your weakness. So first, probably a reaction for most of people will be again interpretations and so on. Yeah, mm. but you want to avoid it. No, I don't want to. Avoid. I just want okay. to come to the root. So there is a fear, and then I go in, and I don't see the root. Yeah, but we now we have to learn how to look for the root. Yeah. So this is what I'm saying. What is there you recognize as well? You're afraid. What else is there? It's not just fear. Some thoughts, some ideas. But good. So Very good. So if there wouldn't be thoughts, it would be their fear. So when there are thoughts, there is the fear. If there were thoughts, there wouldn't be fear. I don't know. They could be fear first, and then the, I think first fear, and then the thoughts. So, well, so then again, thing. why are you afraid of forest? It's not yeah. there a thought of the forest. Yeah. Okay. So it's a thought of the forest, and there's a fear. So would be if there wouldn't be thought of the forest, would be the fear. Probably, hmm. I don't know. Oh, well, see, that's already no. good. Uh, good reason why to be mindful and meditate. You know, we have to, that means meditation, to recognize all these things, so that there, will be, there wouldn't be ever answer, I don't know. Because it's your experience, you have to know what's in your experience. What's the problem with the fear? Pain. Pain? What's the problem with the pain? Because it hurts. Hurts? What's the problem with the, hurt? what's the, problem with the hurt, hurtness? Because you Something. you don't feel uh, pleasant. You, you feel it's painful. Yeah, yeah, it's painful. It's unpleasant. Yeah. So see where is the root problem now? This is for looking at the reason of the fear. And your mind said it will last forever. Yes. <laughs> All conclusions <laughs> will come the, out. Yeah, that's yeah. The, the main problem. Right? Yes. Like, what else do I feel? Well, okay, bottom line is that to cause is ignorance but you, I, you can't expect now just in this conversation yeah. that you can just by choice and decision pull out the ignorance mm. it's not like a knowledge which i can tell you okay well I repeat that mantra that's a knowledge and you do it and we will come everything no so you have to you not resolve this fear of problem just from this discussion here so we have to actually face it like Arjun Shah had to go to the this charnel ground to face it. Uh, Buddha had to go to the also thick jungle to face mm -hmm. the fear. So he talks about it. So it's not only a theory, but something to apply it in the practice. Yeah, so true. now I'm inviting you to face these kind of fears and do something, you know, tonight. <laughs> shame, <laughs> shame, shame you're leaving uh, just, just now because <laughs> we have, you've been staying here with a great opportunity. You just. No, but I mean, through my life, I was facing a fear a lot. For example, also for darkness, I have it a lot. And mm. Also for climbing, for fear of the mm -hmm. height, and mm -hmm. I was facing a lot. So, but you know, I would like to just to because yeah, the root, you know. The, yeah. yeah. The, so, the, the, so we have to stay with it. Yeah, stay with it. Stay with it, and mm -hmm. see actually Everything what is real problem is a fear or yeah. running away from something. Yeah. 
we see that actually there wouldn't be fear, there wouldn't be some thoughts around it. But its mind is so weak, and, uh, uh, and it cannot hold it. It's like, it feels like it's something shattering. It's like some kind of something like it's breaking. And it's so scary. Because why is it so scary of breaking something? Because if you really deep in yourself, you think it should be stable and untouched. And that's, that's called ego or identity, false identity. So you start reaching something like an area which tells you uh, really no entry, forbidden, dangerous, and you believe it. But it's you. Mara will always try to prevent you to do that. And he keeps scaring you that you don't touch that area. Yes, also, also have fears as well, also facing heights, for example. Yeah. But then realize, actually, oh, it's pretty much just it's a thought. It's just feeling, yeah. Well, no, it's, just, it's not just, just feeling, just it's thoughts, but it's just like, you know, person. realize, oh, it's dependent upon the thoughts. So it's not one thing. It doesn't exist on its own. Fear doesn't have to control me. I can control fear. Or, for example, I was you know, reflecting uh, when I had flu, the whole, you know, when it's whole body and everything. With the flu, it's like whole body affects, you know, everything is painful, everything is, the whole body shakes and hot and cold and sweat, you know, all this, you know. And then you're thinking, you know, it's not just like, uh, oh, for one hour and then, oh, I can, it's a bit of break. It's just lasting, yeah. And I was reflecting, and because I was like, sick, and then I just kind of had this kind of wish, you know, oh, it would be nice just to have a little bit of break from this flu, so I can just kind of, whew, and I reflect and go back to it, you know. <laughs> but there's no escape, and when I realize, like, I can't run away, I have to stay with it. But you can see the mind wants to run away, you know. It's unpleasant. You just almost look for something objects or wants to look for distraction it doesn't help very much but just like you know mind is like can be go everywhere so basically try to see day when there is was night yeah. uh, well, it was very hard to see night as night and that remind me also of the sutta when the buddha was saying you know this kind of suffering is like four great mountains like approaching you you know and have no escape mm. It's like pain, it's pretty much like that, you know, but we're making problem out of ignorance, really, because pleasant and unpleasant feeling, they always existed. Buddha had an unpleasant feeling with our ignorance, but we identify ourselves with the feeling, feeling it's me, my feeling, yeah? Do we say that? Do we feel, do we feel like that, you know, where we actually a little bit of fool? That we don't really identify of pleasant, uh, just with feeling, but we do actually it's pleasant feeling. Yeah? We identify ourselves with a pleasant feeling. But there wouldn't be pleasant feeling without unpleasant one. It's a package. And we, we can't really control pleasant and a pleasant feeling. Pleasant feeling it's its own nature arising and ceasing. Unpleasant feeling has a nature rising and ceasing on its own accord. You know, can you tell me when you had a ple pleasant feeling, for example, did you make it to be pleasant or it come? For example, how do you feel now? Pleasant or unpleasant or neutral? Pleasant. Did you make it? No. See? But you think you will control your feelings. But we believe that we can control our feelings. And because that belief shows in passion, that belief shows in anger. So you see, passion, anger are actually effects of the mind who believes, who has the idea, illusion that I am uh, and that I have control over things. Why it's completely illusionary because, you know, the feeling is its own nature rising and ceasing, you have no control over it. 
So when you go to the forest and there is a fear and pleasant feeling, doesn't mean you should not be unpleasant. Doesn't mean when the Buddha will go now to the jungle that he will not maybe feel unpleasant. Maybe he feels pleasant, unpleasant, doesn't matter. But there will not be no passion, no, no anger, I, no fear. Any, any other questions? Okay, in that case, let's...